Okay, welcome everybody to the new, to this new episode of Control Systems. We'll start with a little bit of advertisement. Please take a seat. Break is over. Come, come, come to the IDSC Open Lab Day. Uh, on November the 8th, uh, uh, all the research labs in our institute are going to be showcasing their research. Um, there's going to be lots of fun stuff to see. Uh, you're invited to come along, see the demos, ask questions, get exposure to all sorts of uh, autonomous things, so from uh, flying to, to, to driving to crawling to all that kind of stuff. And most importantly, there's even uh, free food at the end, so that's that. Okay, so in last class we started uh, um, talking about one of the arguably most uh, important concepts whatsoever of control systems, and that is the concept of transfer functions. Guys, please settle down. So where do these transfer functions come from? We started everything and we said, okay, so control systems is this, uh, um, this, this discipline that wants to make systems which are uh, dynamical transformations between inputs and outputs, uh, do whatever we designers want them to do rather than what uh, they would naturally want to do. And uh, so we start by saying, okay, let's take any, any dynamical system of the, of the, the cosmos and let's uh, try to describe it through our knowledge of the physics uh, and, and describe it through a model, through some set of equations, right? And uh, we saw that uh, in the general case, these equations can be arbitrarily messy. Uh, they can be time variant, they can be nonlinear, they can be all sorts of, of, of complicated stuff. But we noticed that uh, um, if we, if we uh, just say, well, let's, let's approximate the behavior of these complex systems around some specific points uh, through a procedure that's called linearization, we can describe the dynamics, that is the relationship between the input and the output and how they change in time, through this set of very special equations, which are the uh, linear time invariant uh, 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 systems. And uh, we introduced this concept of a state variable that said, okay, um, let me, in a neat way, basically take in account everything that happened since the beginning of time so through these uh, uh, weird variables uh, x, we call them, that basically represent somehow a memory of a system, energy reservoirs of the system. And thanks to the introduction of this concept, we could write linear time invariant systems uh, very, very, very well in this very compact form. And so these are fundamentally a uh, set of uh, n first order ordinary differential equations. And they have an input in time, you're given some initial conditions, you can find the output, and we cranked through the math and we saw, well, if we give this uh, uh, x naught, this initial condition, this is how the output looks like, and it was that nasty big equation. And then we said, well, how do we, how, so when we want to control a system, a system is described by these equations, how we need to understand them somehow. We need to be able to analyze them. Now this first part of the course is about the analysis, and then we'll get to the part of the synthesis where it's like, okay, now how do we actually make the system do what we want it to do? And we saw that the um, response of the system could be divided into two parts, one that depended on the initial conditions, one that depended on the input. And we kind of cracked through it a little bit, and uh, we noticed that there were some fundamental properties of the system, and uh, say the eigenvalues of the A matrix, that would uh, tell us if the system, for example, was stable or not, which, which was a big deal. But we noticed that the math was kind of complicated. So we introduced this uh, other concept, which we started talking about last time, which uh, uh, was that of transfer function. And a transfer function basically is uh, a more in-depth analysis of what happens on the second part of that output equation, the one where it depends on the input, which we hadn't looked at before. And it turns out, and we will uh, look at it better today, that it's really nice to work with transfer functions because they make all the math easy, insightful, and uh, they become a tool of preference in the analysis of control systems and in the synthesis. So today what are we going to do? We're going to uh, finish last week's class in the sense we're going to continue talking about transfer functions. We're going to see um, when these transfer functions uh, are, are 
how can we express transfer functions, and we'll do a little bit of sectioning of them, and we'll see with each term of the transfer function what does it tell us and how it is related to the system. And we'll probably not get to this part today, uh, but uh, we all start out of doing, doing some examples and analyze what are the funky behaviors that we can see in transfer functions. So after the whole analysis of uh, linear time invariant systems, we concluded that the output was this nasty equation. No, and we saw this last time. And we said, look, this depends on the transfer function, on the, sorry, the initial conditions. Well, this part here depends on the input, right? So we understood how this worked out because it was a function of this matrix exponential, and we saw that uh, if we're smart about choosing the coordinates of the system and express this A matrix in a diagonal form, well, then that term becomes very easy, becomes just a sum of exponentials, right? Where each exponential tells us uh, is, is, is a function of, uh, of um, the eigenvalues of the A matrix. And, uh, and uh, basically, well, it, it, it is a very, a very clear relationship between the properties and the system and how this first term behaves, if it converges, if it diverges, if it stays bounded for forever. So um, we remembered, we noticed that, well, if these eigenvalues of the A matrix were real numbers, then we got some very straightforward behavior. It's an exponential with a real number at the exponent. So what does it mean? It means if the number is positive, that thing grows. Number is negative, the thing converges. If instead it's a constant, if it's a zero, for example, well, this becomes a constant value. Well, instead, if you had uh, an imaginary number there, well, we, we saw that uh, we could associate um, imaginary um, exponential terms to oscillations, to sine waves, okay? And that's, that's something that's gonna come over uh, come back over and over again. So we figured out what there was to figure out about this first term. Now we say, okay, but look at the second one. It's really messy, right? There's that big integral with this convolution operation, whatever it is. It's like not straightforward to understand how can, uh, what's the map between this input signal and the output signal, which is clearly very important, right? So we have a strategy for this. Our strategy is the following. We say, okay, let's try to figure out this term, the second nasty term for a simple signal, simple input signal, where simple means, um, means uh, that provides us some insight on the system. And then let's uh, leverage the fact that the system is uh, linear. So being it linear, it means that there is the superposition principle, which means that if I know what's the output associated to an input, and I know a bunch of these uh, outputs associated to a bunch of inputs, well, if I just send an input that is the sum of all these elementary inputs, then the output is going to be the sum of the elementary outputs. And what's this, the, the third and most important step of the strategy? We're doing this, this, this three-step approach because we are betting on the fact that actually, and this is kind of the magic of this whole deal, actually we'll show that almost every possible input signal that you can come up with can be expressed as a sum of these elementary terms. So it's a three-step approach. Let's figure out how it works with an elementary term. We know that if we sum elementary terms, the output is summed up together, so whatever we, have, we understand for the elementary terms works for the sum, and then we show every input of the world can be expressed as an infinite sum of these elementary terms, okay? So that's where we started uh, last time, and we said, look, the simple term, so to speak, is UE at the ST, where S is, in general, a complex number. So S is something like sigma plus J omega, right? So J is, of course, the, the, the imaginary part. So something that might be confusing now or as we go forward is this fact of imaginary numbers. Like, what does it really mean? Now, we're, we're talking about real systems here. We're talking about physical stuff, mechanical systems. Like, so what does it mean to send an imaginary input, right? It's, uh, how do you do it? So it's intended somehow that every time we send an imaginary input, what we're really sending is an imaginary input plus its complex conjugate. And if you recall uh, Euler's equations, um, which say that basically e at the j omega t or e at the jx 
can be expressed as what? As a cosine of omega t plus j sine of omega t. And if there is a minus here, we put a minus there. Well, if we sum two of these signals in this way, what we get is a real signal. Okay, so if you sum two complex conjugate signals, you get a real signal, and actually it's, it's, it's an oscillation. So the, we, throw, we threw in this E at the ST. We did a bunch of calculations, which we're not going to redo again today. And what did we show? We showed that the output can be uh, grouped up in two terms. The first one is function of this exponential here, okay? This was the same thing we saw for the initial condition part. It's the transient response. Why is it transient? It's transient because it really changes in time. For example, if you have, um, if you have like uh, um, um, an asymptotically stable system, so we now know what that means, it means that if you just uh, set the initial conditions to some bounded value, you don't just go crazy and put them in infinite, and you let the system go, well, it will do what it has to do, but at some point, as time goes to infinity, it will just converge to zero, right? So suppose we're dealing with a, a asymptotically stable system, then as time goes to infinity, this part here will just go away, will go to zero, because it will be dominated by this exponential that goes to zero. Well, what we're left with is what is called the steady state response. It's a steady state because Everything that had to, because the transient response died out. It's what, it, what keeps on going if you keep the input going. And so the relationship between this special input and the output is given by this, this, this function here. This function here, remember that C, A, B, D, these come from x dot equals ax plus bu and y equals cx plus du, okay? So a, B, C, D in the version of the systems we are studying now are, are numbers, are parameters, are vectors, matrices of uh, numbers. They don't vary in time. And we said that S is a complex number, so all of this basically is, uh, is, uh, is, is a scalar, is a number. You can see that this is a one by one, this is an n by one, because this is a one, actually this is a one by n. We're doing CISO systems, right? So this means that uh, we have a single input and a single output. X is an M by one, A is an M by N, and so on and so forth. So if you look at this, you get C that is an M by one, S is a number, one by one, A is an M by N. The, of course, I here is an identity matrix M by UN to make the dimensions compatible. B, we said, is an M by one. D is a one by one. If you do the multiplications, you see that this whole thing becomes an n by n, and you've got a one by n by an n by n by an n by one. This is a one by one. It's transfer function, this, 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 this apparently complicated thing, all it is, it's a number that is a function of s, okay? And, uh, and so if we just look at the steady state part here, we can say, look, the relationship between the input and the output at steady state is given by this function, which we call transfer function. And, uh, and note how this transfer function is evaluated at what point? At the point given by this, the exponent of this magic input that we chose. So, okay, that's interesting. Um, Let's, uh, let's see what happens if uh, we choose to send in a signal that is uh, the sum of two of these elementary signals. For example, a sinusoid or a cosine. And we do this by just uh, summing, it, summing up two uh, exponential terms. And, uh, and the result is really surprising, not surprising, but it's really beautiful. Because what it's telling us is that if we send into the signal, uh, in this case, two cosine of omega t, at steady state, and we'll call the system g of s from now on, remember at the beginning we use the sigmas, no, no signals anymore. Uh, we know that the, 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 the systems now are completely described by these, these functions, the transfer functions, so it's going to be completely um, customary to, to denote these blocks with the, with the transfer function, basically. So, um, so the steady state answer here, the steady state output is going to be what? It's going to be, um, well, let's see, no? Because 
Suppose that we send the, the first signal, we get the first output. We send the second signal, we get the second output. We know for linearity that if we send the sum of two inputs, we get the sum of two outputs. So what's the, and this is what this equation here is telling us. Well, if we send as input E at the J omega T, we just saw before that uh, the steady state solution for a certain input E at the ST is given by this transfer function evaluated at S times E at the ST. So in this case, S is equal to J omega and minus J omega, right? So we get this first term, which is the Y1, and this second term here, which is the Y2. Now, how, what are we going to do about this? Well, these we agreed to before that are just numbers, but, but they're complex numbers, right? So we know that a complex number in general, uh, something like this, can be expressed, for example, with the magnitude times E at the what? At the J phase of the number, right? And we saw this before. This is just basic uh, complex numbers. So what we do is we say, well, look at this transfer function evaluated in J omega minus J omega. Let's just, we don't know really what it is, but we know it's a complex number. So let's break it down in its magnitude and phase. And it's what we do here. And uh, if you just then uh, uh, do the last passage before here, which is just noticing that you can put these things together. you can see that the output at steady state is a cosine. So you send a sine function in, sine in this case a cosine, and you get at steady state a cosine as an output. It's the same thing. And it's the cosine at the same exact frequency. The frequency of the input was omega. The frequency of the output is omega. What's the difference? The only difference is that whatever signal you sent, this, the sine wave you sent as an input is Multiplied is scaled by an m factor, the magnitude of the transfer function evaluated at that specific frequency, and it's, uh, the phase of it is changed by the phase of the transfer function at that particular point in frequency. This is an important result because it allows us you would say, okay, well, how do you really care, right? It's, like, uh, it's not like you go and send sine waves to systems as, a, as, as an ordinary thing in life. But really what this, this, the, what this result tells us is that if we send a sine wave at a certain frequency that we can control as an input, and we just wait enough until the system gets to steady state, of course it has to be stable, then uh, if we just look at how much the magnitude has increased or decreased of the output signal and how much it's delayed with respect to the input, we know exactly what's the value of the transfer function of that system at that point of frequency. If we repeat this process with a bunch of cosines, we start with cosine at 0.1 hertz, and then we do at 0.2, and then at 0.3, and then at 1, and then at 5, and then at 10, just sweep through the frequency domain by sending a bunch of these sine waves one after the other, you can map the transfer function at least the frequency response in this case, of, uh, of a system you knew nothing about before. This is the basis of system identification. It's one of the most common methods, in which is basically the way in which you, you model a system if you don't know the laws of physics. You start just sending a bunch of sine waves. You measure the output of the sine wave. You see the magnitude and phase. You do lots of experiments. You get a, trans a, a, a transfer function of, of the system, which is a good model. Today we will see how to bounce back between uh, uh, time domain equations and, 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 and uh, frequency domain equations. That is, uh, how we go from, so we, we, we saw it before that, uh, if you have x dot equals a x plus b u, well, you get the transfer function as that, uh, the transfer here, if we pass from uh, state space equations, to transfer function, this is the relationship. The transfer function is this combination of the, of the, of, of the A, B, C, D matrices. How does it work vice versa? Like if you're given a transfer function, what's the corresponding A, B, C, D matrices? This is something we'll look later today. So we don't need to review linearity. Let's try to, to, to now go towards this final step, which is, okay, we figured out how what the answer is to a single input, 
Uh, now, we all agree that the system is linear, so it means that if we send two, we get the sum of the two as the output. In general, where we're trying to head here is trying to say, look, what if I could express an input, any input signal, or at least a bunch of input signals, as a sum of all these elementary terms? Well, then I would know the output in pretty much any case. So, and we would know that if we sent in a bunch of signals that are just the scaled uh, exponentials, yet the STs, like the one we just saw, the output would be a sum of terms, which would be exactly the same input, but scaled by the transfer function. So um, let's do a simple example here. So let's suppose we have a scalar system. And um, a scalar system is a system where basically it's described by these equations here. Um, by inspection, it's easy to tell what the A, B, C, D matrices are, because the A here is whatever is the relationship between x dot and x. It's a minus one. The B here is just a one, because it's what's the relationship between the x dot and the U. The C has been chosen here again to be one, and the D is zero, because we don't have an extra term here. Okay, so once we're given A, B, C, and D, it's straightforward to write out what the transfer function is. The transfer function is C, S, I minus A inverse B plus D. Okay, let's do it. No? And this is straightforward because C is one, S, I is S, minus A is minus one. So minus minus one is plus one, inverse times what? Times B, B is one, plus zero of D, which is this equation here. So this is a very complicated way of saying S plus one inverse, which is one over S plus one. Okay, this is the transfer function of the system. Very well. So first of all, uh, what can we observe? We can observe that the transfer function is, we, we, we kind of uh, anticipated that it was a, a complex number and that's, that's settled. It's nice to observe that it's a ratio of two things. Uh, we'll see that this is, works in general. In general, a transfer function is a ratio of two polynomials. And, uh, and look at the denominator a second. So what does it tell you? Uh, that's S plus one. Can, can, we, can we do any observation related to this denominator with respect to what the characteristics of the systems are? So we said a lot in previous classes that uh, what was super important to determine the stability of a system, terms like structural properties of a system, the eigenvalues of the A matrix, right? And here we've got the A matrix that is just a number, so what's the eigenvalue of a number? Well, it's not really much of a choice there, so it's, it's the number itself. And, uh, and look at this. So the denominator of the transfer function is basically that eigenvalue, or at least uh, what happens if we put S equals minus one in here, which is the eigenvalue of the, of the A matrix, you get one over minus one plus one, which is something that is really ugly, right? Because you can't really put zeros at the denominator. So what does this tell us? In fact, when we derived the transfer function, if you remember the passages we did, at some point we said, hey, when we're solving the integral, S cannot be an eigenvalue of the A matrix. Otherwise, the SI minus A inverse doesn't exist. So I think the observation that makes sense to do here is uh, the denominator of the transfer function. So the transfer function is a ratio of two polynomials. There's going to be a numerator, there's going to be a denominator. Let's leave the numerator aside a little bit because it's kind of the, the mystery term in transfer function. It's not mystery, it's very well understood, but it's a little bit more complicated. The denominator of the transfer function is uh, really, really important because it's related to the A matrix. And uh, for now, what we can say is that it uh, has something to do with the eigenvalues of the A matrix. Actually, the eigenvalues of the A matrix are zeros of the denominator, are roots of the denominator. What does it mean? It means if you plug them in, you get zero at the denominator, okay? And, uh, and they have a special name. They're called the poles of the system, as we will see better later. Okay, so we're doing an exercise here. So really what we want to do is we want to find an equation. We want to find like the solution. What's the output at steady state for the system if we send as an input a cosine wave? Now, first, we're doing steady state, right? So let's not forget the assumptions we're making. When you get a steady state, you get a steady state if the system is asymptotically stable, right? Otherwise, it's going to blow up. There's no steady state. So is the system asymptotically stable here? Well, let's look. What does asymptotic stability depend on? 
depends on, on, on the eigenvalues of the A matrix, right? And in this case, it's minus one. It's a real number, it's uh, a continuous time system. The real part of it is less than one, is uh, negative. So this means the system is indeed asymptotically stable. So what's the strategy here to actually find the answer? It's what we've been saying up to now. U of t can be expressed as a sum of two of these elementary terms. Let's find the outputs corresponding to the two individual uh, elementary terms, put them together, and we're, uh, and we're done. So we can just, rem we have to remember that the output of steady state is equal to the transfer function evaluated at the point of, uh, of, of uh, the point and frequency of this exponential signal. And of course, if the input is uh, scaled by some number, the output is scaled as well, always for linearity. So let's look at what happens if we send, uh, if we consider u1 to be one half e at the j omega t, where we just call u1 to be a half, and s1 we see that it's plus j omega. Well, uh, we just plug in these numbers here, s equals j omega and u equals one half, and what we get is this. Now, remember that g of s is equal to what? G of s is equal to, from the previous example, let's go and double check, it was one over s plus one. So what is g of j omega? Well, g of j omega is one over, every time you read s, you plug in j omega. So it's j omega plus one. Okay, what are we gonna do about that? Well, for now, let's keep it like this. Then later on, we'll see that uh, um, all this is, is just a complex number. And we know everything about complex numbers now. When you see a complex number, what you have to think is, well, there's a magnitude and there's a phase. So, we do the same process for the second input, and what we get is exactly the same thing, only that instead of putting s equals j omega, now we're putting s equal minus j omega. So we get, of course, a different in signs here. Well, then what's the output to if now u is the sum of u1 plus u2, what's the output? It's the sum of y1 plus y2. You just plug in the two terms we found from before, you do a few passages and you get this output. So this is a way to directly derive what is at every point in time the output just by working with transfer functions, given this particular input, given an asymptotically stable system. But, uh, so again, we see that uh, we, saw, we sent in a cosine wave, we got out something that kind of recalls sine waves. It's a cosine plus an omega sine. It's not really as, as clean as before. I, I mean, a few slides ago, we just said that if you send the cosine as input, you get m cosine of omega t plus phi, where m is the magnitude of the transfer function at j omega, and phi is the phase of the transfer function at j omega. And how does this uh, relate to this, right? Do you see it as being the same exact thing? Yes, no, maybe? Yes, no, yes, raise your hand if it's yes. Do you see it as being exactly the same thing? Yeah? No? Maybe, you trust? No, I don't know, you're gonna think about it. Well, um, I encourage you to go back home and to do the passages, okay? So try to express y of t, just, t let's do it like this. Just find, the, get g, okay, the transfer function, g of s is one over s plus one. So how, let's, we need to find the, the magnitude and the phase of g of j omega. How do you do that? If you have a, trans a, a complex number, how do you find the magnitude? How do you find the phase? Well, these are simple things, but they're important. So here we put the real part. Suppose we have a complex number A plus IB, or JB we've been using. Here you put the imaginary part. Well, you've got an A real part, got a B uh, imaginary part. This means that we can represent the complex number Z like this. The magnitude is the length of this vector, and the phase is this angle here. 
So how do you find the magnitude of z? Well, with the Pythagoras, a squared plus b squared. How do you find the phase of z? Which is actually b is equal to the phase of z. Well, 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 how do we find this? Well, it's the arc tangent of this part here, delta y over delta x, which is b over a. So how do you find the complex, uh, the, the, um, the magnitude of j, of j omega? Well, you plug in j omega plus one. Now you've got a transfer, you've got a complex number, you just find magnitude of phase. So do this at home and convince yourself that if you actually evaluate these two terms and you use some obscure properties of trigonometry, I don't know how much you remember C, but I won't spoil you the fun, but it is possible to actually relate these two things that are exactly the same. So, Look, even computers agree. If you just send an input that is the blue signal, an input this is a sine wave, and you keep it going, well, the output of the system, y of t, is this red line down here. You see that it starts from an initial condition for a period of time up to here, roughly. It, uh, whoa, it, uh, uh, it has this weird behavior, this, this red thing, because now, for that period of time, the output is the sum of two terms. It's the sum of uh, a transient term plus the steady state term. And since this is an asymptotically stable system, this transient part will go to zero after some time. And you see that in this case, the time is roughly three seconds. This, this red line converges to what is the steady state response. How what is the steady state response? The one which we just calculated, a cosine wave that has exactly the same frequency as the input. If you note, the frequency of the blue and the red are exactly the same, but the amplitude is different. You had an amplitude of one as the input, the out amplitude of the output is what? Maybe 0.4 here. So the ratio between one and 0.4 is basically what the magnitude of the transfer function is at that, at that point in frequency, means at the frequency of the, of the sine wave that we sent as an input. And then there's clearly a phase delay, right? You see the peaks of the steady state output are here, while the peaks of the input are there. This phase delay here is the phase delay induced by the transfer function at the point in frequency. These concepts of magnitude and phase of the transfer functions are so important that in the next three classes, basically, all we're going to do is find a way to map these magnitudes and phases of transfer functions in, in reasonable ways, uh, in graphical ways without having to do all nasty calculations. And we'll see that just by tuning these magnitudes and phases, we can actually control systems. We can actually get very decent insights on what is going on. Okay, so are there any questions about this? So, well, um, let's now try, we saw that a transfer function, if we, 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 we derived it by sending this simple input as uh, E at the SD, right? We did step one, we did step two, we still didn't do step three of the grand strategy, which is uh, answer the question, hey, but is it that every input in the world is expressible as a sum of all these terms? And we'll get to that. But before, let's, let's have a little bit of a, of a of a look at how can we express transfer functions in general. We have kind of done examples up to now. We know that this is a general expression of a transfer function because we defined it this way. Now, suppose that we were, remember modal coordinates, uh, every system has its favorite way of expressing uh, the, the output. And if you find the eigenvalues of, a, of an A matrix and you build the trans similarity transformations with the eigenvectors, you can express a system in modal coordinates, which means that uh, A is diagonal, okay? So let's suppose that A is diagonal and uh, uh, it has on its diagonal the, um, the um, eigenvalues and uh, b is going to be just a vector b1 up to bn, and the c is just going to be a c1 to cn. Well, uh, in this case, we can see that the transfer function, I mean, we can literally do the math here. Uh, this is c1 to cn. Now, what's si minus a inverse? Well, it's uh, s minus lambda 1 up to s minus lambda n, bunch of zeros inverse. And then there's B. B here is B1 to Bn. 
Well, this is a diagonal matrix. The inverse of the diagonal matrix is just the inverse of the elements of the diagonal. So this is C1 to Cn, 1 over S minus lambda 1, 1 over S minus lambda n, zero zeros, and always the b's here. So if we do the rows time columns, what we get is this. Now look at that. This matches our observations of before. The transfer function can be expressed as a sum of m terms. Each term depends on two things. It has a numerator that is a function of the c's and b matrices. And the denominator is directly a function of the eigenvalues of it. Now, if we were just to put all of this together, we would get at the denominator s, s minus lambda 1, s minus lambda 2, times, 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 s minus lambda m, right? What is that? I mean, this is the, a polynomial that has solutions, that is roots, that is zeros, at every eigenvalue of A, which is the definition of the characteristic polynomial of A. The denominator here of the transfer function, which in general we can express as an nth order polynomial, is exactly the determinant of Si minus A, the characteristic polynomial of A. It's the intermediate step, for, it's, it's the way you find the eigenvalues of the A matrix. Now you just put this equal to zero and you find the solution. So nice, what does this tell us? It tells us, look, in general, the transfer function can be decomposed, a bunch of terms. Each one is a function of a specific eigenvalue weighted by, by, by this numerator number, which we will call a residue. But in general, we can write the transfer function as a ratio of two polynomials. Uh, for every causal system, we are going to get that the denominator has a degree that is higher than the numerator. But this is just a general expression, so we will see that we will write it actually in a different way depending on what we want to do with it, how we want to describe this, uh, this transfer function, and the different formulations will give us different insights. But this is the most general expression. Now, what would I like to observe? I would like to observe that uh, transfer functions are really important because they, tell, they, they are the map between the input and the output of any linear time invariant system, at least the output of steady state. So they contain a lot of information. And all we need from a mathematical perspective to describe them completely is polynomials, which is like high school math. Now, okay, how we got here, it was a little bit messy, but uh, it's really relatively simple math that is really powerful because it has the, uh, the, a descriptive uh, uh, capacity of everything that is described of as a linear time invariant system, which we saw that is pretty much a good approximation of anything that happens in the world. So anything that happens can be approximated and described as behaving with a ratio of two polynomials, which is, I think, an, an interesting observation. Why did this just happen? Okay, so, well, but um, we can, uh, we, 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 we said, okay, if you give us an, uh, a system, x dot equals ax plus bu, we get a uh, transfer function. We can express it with, uh, with the equation of the transfer function, right? But what if we want to do the opposite? What if uh, we're given a transfer function as a ratio of two polynomials? And somebody asks us, well, uh, what's the x dot equals ax plus bu system that matches that transfer function? And uh, this problem is called a realization problem. So going from uh, transfer functions to systems is what's the realization of that system? And we knew from before when we uh, played around with the concept of state variable, that uh, there are actually a bunch of different uh, state, different choices of state variables that, that are equivalent in describing the behavior of a system, right? And in fact, it turns out that there are many different solutions to the realization problem. There isn't a unique set of ABCD that matches that transfer function. So we get kind of to choose, there's, there's degrees of freedom. And so what we're interested in is something that is called a minimal realization. So 
You might remember the fact that once we looked at the modal forms, it was really obvious when a system was controllable and observable. And controllability and observability were two really important concepts for us. I mean, when I control a system, it has to be controllable. Like, the input must have the ability to actually vary the states. So we might be interested, for example, among the many different realizations we could have, descriptions of in linear and in state space form given a transfer function, we might be interested in having those that are controllable forms or observable forms or controllable and observable forms. So there are some famous, uh, let's say, realizations. And uh, if we write a transfer function, if we're given a transfer function, as, as, as we saw before, this was called the partial fraction uh, representation, then you can see that uh, this is the realization. And we're not going to show the intermediate passages, but, uh, but it's easy to verify that this is correct. Just take those A, B, C, Ds, just calculate G of S as uh, uh, C, S, I minus A inverse B plus D, and you'll see that you'll get exactly this. Okay, so I will stop five minutes before time, and I will give the word to our friend that is going to tell you how to evaluate the course or me. What is it? Both. Okay, so there you go. Here. Um, so you all probably know this by now. We've done it in dynamics and thermodynamics. Um, we're also evaluating um, control systems, so it would be great if you could just Go on your Edo app uh, on the semester questions and answer those six questions real quick. And therefore, we can then like hope to ameliorate and make everything better. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so I'll give you the rest of the four minutes to do this evaluation, and then we can continue after the break. Okay, so okay, so we have seen that uh, the realization problem is the problem of finding ABCD when you're given a transfer function. There are many different ABCDs one can find when a transfer function is given. So how do you choose which one is the best one? Well, uh, it depends what you want to do with it, right? These are all models, they're representations, they have to be useful to us. So we recall we had introduced uh, last class or maybe a couple of classes ago the concepts of observability and controllability, which are some very important structural properties of a system because they If you have questions, comments, or doubts, just raise your hand. We have a beautiful thing here to throw around, and you can ask. So what was I saying? I was saying that uh, controllability and observability are two important properties. So well, why not choose minimal realizations? That is, realizations, that is, ABCD matrices that match that specific transfer function that you're given. But if you go and check the rank of the observability and controllability matrix, you get controllable and observable systems. So that's a very, a very uh, mean, I mean, sensible thing to do. And so how does the realization look like in a general case? We said, well, in the most general possible case, a transfer function is a ratio of two polynomials. Okay, so it's just what you see up there. And uh, well, if we're given this as a transfer function, what is the realization that is controllable? For example, the so-called controllable canonical form. Well, 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 all you have to do is take an identity matrix. You got an identity matrix in the top bottom corner, a bunch of zeros here. And at the last line, you put all the coefficients of the denominator. And then you put the coefficients in the numerator in C. So this is kind of arbitrary. You're saying, yeah, but you're just telling me that this is the solution, right? I encourage you now to take these A, B, C, and Ds as a practice exercise and calculate the transfer function, which is given by C, S, I minus A inverse B plus D. And you plug in those A, B, C, Ds, you'll indeed find that you get as a result the uh, general form of the transfer function. Now, just uh, for your reference, this is like a student thing. 
I think number three most common mistake that people do in exams in these kind of situations is uh, not noticing that there is a one here, okay? So you're given a transfer function, exercise, find the, uh, the controllable canonical form of this transfer function, Well, make sure you, you actually put it in that form before just copying the coefficients. Like the coefficient of S of n has to be one. Okay, so if you have a number multiplying, just rearrange it and bring it out. Okay, so finally we get to this final uh, magical part. So we said that we want to analyze that second part of the output of a linear time invariant system that is a messy, a messy convolution with the input. We said, look, choose this, this E at the ST as an input, this elementary input that really makes sense. And why does it really make sense? Just trust me, I told you. No, it's like uh, we see that we get the transfer function as, as, uh, um, as mapping between the input, the specific input and the output. We know, we knew but from before that, well, if I send a number, a sum of these elementary inputs will get a sum of elementary outputs as the output. So what if we could express any possible signal input as uh, a sum of these elementary inputs? And, uh, and it turns out that that's the case. So there is something called uh, uh, Laplace transforms, which you might have heard before. How many of you know what a Laplace transformation is? Beautiful. Uh, so, basically, all this conversation we had up to now, we could have just said, hey, transfer functions are defined as the Laplace, uh, the ratio of the output to the input in the Laplace domain. And just take the Laplace transformation of x dot equals ax plus mu, move things around, and you get the transfer function. So choosing this E at the ST was kind of an escamotage just to avoid introducing transfer uh, Laplace transformations to get to the transfer function. And what is the, uh, the actually the, the reason for which we're introducing now Laplace transformations? It's just to say, look, it is actually possible to represent every possible signal, almost every possible signal, actually not all possible signals, as a, as, a, as a sum of these elementary inputs. Why? Well, because, uh, um, because look, the, the, the Laplace transformation of a signal, it's the integral of that signal multiplied by uh, this E at the ST, which is kind of a recurrent term, right? So, so well, okay, put that in pause a second, we introduce the Laplace transformations, we need to be rigorous, so, well, Laplace transformation has, as you all know, uh, anti-transformations. Basically, the Laplace transformation is, is this, this tool that brings you from the time domain in this frequency domain, and the anti-transformation was thus the inverse, brings you from the frequency domain back to the time domain. See it as a, this, this, it's magic, pure black magic, and, uh, but it allows us to just bounce back between time and frequency domain how many times you want for free. Okay, so it's completely equivalent to look at things in the time domain and in the frequency domain, as long as you remember that the Laplace transformation is the door and its inverse are the tools that allow you to switch back and forth between the different representations. So really, what, what we do through this inverse transformation is seeing that, look, pretty much any signal in time can be expressed as a jumble, jumble, jumble integral of U of S E at the ST. So an integral is really what? Just a sum, right? A sum of a person that is very, very patient. Like an integral is a sum of infinite terms, right? So of which terms? Well, they are terms that are U at the S times E at the ST. So basically they are weighted Exponentials. So we built up this whole mechanism. We said, look, if we could express any input signal as a sum of some weighted E at the STs, because we know E at the ST, what, 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 what response it gets from a linear time invariant system. And in fact, we can get the output expressed in this way. So, well, look, the past transformations are basically doing exactly the same thing. It's only that they're using infinite terms to describe uh, uh, any input. Does that make any sense? You see the equivalence? This is a sum, this is an integral, but a sum is a discrete integral, basically. We said let's do it for some weighted exponentials. So the Laplace transformation is actually a weighted exponential. So it's pretty much the same thing. It's just that uh, we need to use infinite terms to describe any possible input. 
So, well, if uh, we send now this infinite amount of terms, each one being a, a, a weighted exponential, the output is going to be an infinite sum of weighted exponentials, each one mediated through the transfer function evaluated at, its, at that specific point in frequency. It's exactly what we have been saying until now, only that now we smoothen it out in, in the continuous time. So each one of these inf S, uh, every point in frequency, you got the transfer function that contributes at that specific point in frequency. And we can see here that really y of t is nothing but the inverse Laplace transformation of gs times q of s, which brings us to this, uh, uh, to this uh, conclusion that we had already uh, introduced, so it's not really a surprise to us. But it shows us that in the general case, the transfer function is nothing but the map, the, the, the um, relationship between the input and the output of a linear time invariant system at steady state. Basically, g of s is y of s over u of s. And this is very nice. So it means that if we have an asymptotically stable system, so we don't need to worry about the first term and things blowing up, well, we can see how a system responds to various inputs just by understanding the behavior of the transfer function. OK, so now that we, um, that we believe that the transfer function is actually something relevant, let's go and uh, see a little bit more how to write it and uh, what does each term mean and how does it contribute to the bigger picture. So we said that in general, a transfer function can be represented as a ratio of polynomials. And uh, uh, we said, well, if the A matrix is actually uh, diagonal because we were smart enough to choose the modal form, then we would get a partial fraction representation, which is just a sum of uh, uh, n terms, each one of which has um, uh, uh, one of the eigenvalues at the denominator. Now, and here we switch to slightly the, the, the notation because uh, we're about to introduce two, diff, two, two very important words, two very important uh, pieces of terminology. And there are the so-called poles and the so-called zeros. Let's not confuse these. So what is a pole? A pole of a system is the value of s such that the denominator of the transfer function is equal to zero. So a pole of a system is a zero of the denominator of the transfer function. Don't get confused. Because a zero of a system is a zero, it's a solution of the numerator of the transfer function. So it's, I understand it's not uh, straightforward, but basically look at this. You've got g of s, well, the poles, pole one, pole two, pole n, are numbers that if we plug s equal to one of these poles, what we get is a zero at the denominator of the transfer function. So the poles are the solutions to the characteristic polynomial of a, which is the denominator of the transfer function. Now, what are the zeros? The zeros are just the same thing, but for the numerator. So the zeros of a transfer function are all those s's such that the numerator of s is equal to zero. Okay, so the zeros, let's call them zero i's, are all those values that satisfy the numerator of the transfer function being equal to zero. And uh, we will see later on that actually these uh, well, it's, it's, it's uh, straightforward to see. Now, so if you have, we, we know now that the output in the frequency domain is equal to gs times u of s, but g of s is a numerator times a denominator of u of s. Now, suppose that we send in a sine wave, uh, we, 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 send in a, we send in an input that is a sine wave at, the, at a specific frequency that is called the zero of the system. Well, uh, this transfer function is going to be evaluated at the zero. By definition, this is equal to zero. It means that if you send a sine wave at that specific frequency, you'll get nothing as an output. You'll get zero. That's why it's called the zero, because it kills basically that frequency in uh, the output. 
Okay, so we will look at all of this more in detail, but just to, uh, just to introduce you what these important terms are. So, okay, now focus a second on this uh, partial fraction representation of the, of the transfer function. We've got a bunch of terms. Each one is a function of, has a denominator, a pole of the system, which we know is a eigenvalue of the A matrix. And they're all weighted by these terms, right? So these terms we call residuals. And, uh, and the natural question is how do we calculate the residuals, right? If we're given a transfer function in this form, from here, how do you get R1 to Rn? And why do we care about that? Well, if you have those residuals, then uh, all you need to do is find the, the poles of the system, the zeros of the denominator of the transfer function. You know the residuals, you know the output. We will look at a way to find these residuals in a few uh, slides. But there's always, there is even other um, ways in which one can represent a transfer function. And we will see as we go forward that one of the, 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 the nice things about using transfer function is actually we don't need to do all the math. We don't need to do all the tedious calculations with uh, complex numbers and find the, um, the magnitudes, the phases, and all of that. But actually, we can uh, just draw the solutions. There are graphical methods that allow us to, to, to analyze these transfer functions. So in order to, let's say, um, get the graphical methods to work more intuitively, it is uh, uh, useful to, to write transfer function in a slightly different way. So one is called the root locus form. And uh, I don't know if you remember, I showed a few graphs the other day and I said, okay, don't really worry about these, but this is the root locus of the system. The root locus is a way to, the name says it all, the root locus, the root is, so the term root, zero, and solution are mathematically synonyms. They all mean a number that if you plug it in an equation, you get a zero, okay? So the root locus, all it does is it shows the locus, that is the trajectories, if you want, of the poles of the system, the roots of the denominator, as you uh, vary some parameters. So when we will draw root locuses, and we will do that in next week, I think, if I manage to get through this class, um, it will be a really powerful way for us to see how things change, because if we have a graphical way to see how the poles move, then we can tell what the output of a system is. Another very powerful representation of uh, transfer functions is I, I, when we saw the example, we thought, okay, look, really, if you send in a sine wave as, a, as, a, as an input to the system, you get an output that is a sine wave, right? But it's a sine wave that it's mediated. It's, it's changed in magnitude by the magnitude of the transfer function, and it's delayed in phase by the phase of the transfer function. So, well, it kind of makes sense to have a way to see the transfer function's magnitude and phases separately, and that's called the Bode uh, representation. So this is something we'll do in the next weeks, and basically uh, we will see that it makes a lot of sense to write the transfer function in this different way, uh, just to ease the process of graphical representation of the magnitude and the phase of the transfer function independently. And basically, work, these two forms are what we're going to work on for the next weeks because, again, transfer functions are really important because they characterize the input-output relationships of a system. If we manage to parse these transfer functions in a graphical way, well, that makes our life much easier. So, so one would say, okay, we did an exercise just before where we said, take this transfer function, plug in the, send as an input a sine wave, how do you get the output? No problem, just put j omega in the g, do all the math, find the absolute, uh, uh, the magnitude of the transfer function at that specific point and frequency, find the phase of it, and then use the property that we saw before. Basically, we were saying, if you send u of t, that is a cosine of omega t, uh, which is e at the j omega t plus e at the minus j omega t apart from, from a coefficient from 2, whatever. So what is the output? The output is g at the s i, so g at the s1, so it's g at the what? Omega t e at the j omega t plus g at the minus omega, mm, sorry, e at the j omega minus j omega, e at the minus j omega t, okay? And um, 
And uh, well, uh, we said that this can be rewritten as the magnitude of J omega times cosine omega t plus phi, where phi is the phase of G of J omega, right? So super easy, just plug in J omega inside the transfer function. We saw in the example our G of s before was 1 over s plus 1. Just plug J omega in place of s, do all your math, find the magnitude, find the phase, plug it in there, you got it. Sure, that's feasible, but it's not uh, very nice. So by just expressing the transfer function in a different way, we can do those calculations without actually doing the math. And all we need to observe is that uh, since this is a complex number and it's a ratio of polynomials, well, let's first uh, uh, break the factorialize this thing. So break the numerator and the denominator into its factors, okay? So let's suppose we have this G of S like this. Well, you'll have, a, let's say, constant, a gain in front of it that we just uh, ignore because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, depend on S. The numerator is S plus one, so it's a factor directly. There's no way to break down, that down in an easier form. And the denominator is, is, is a third order, um, it's a um, third degree polynomial. So suppose you have uh, um, a very good way of uh, uh, figuring out what are the solutions of that equation, s cubed plus 4s squared plus 6s plus 4. Suppose that we are able to find out that there are minus 2 and minus 1 plus minus uh, j. We can uh, rewrite the denominator as uh, uh, simply the products of each um, factor, right? In general, if you have uh, an equation that has uh, solutions, uh, uh, let's say P1, uh, P2, Pn, such that whatever polynomial, let's call the denominator of S, denominator of pi is equal to zero, then we can rewrite this, of course, as s minus p1, s minus p2, till s minus pn. So this is what we've done now. So how does this help us? Well, we went from a messy thing to a messy thing just written in a different way, so it doesn't seem like we made any step forward. But actually, now come some, uh, um, to our aid, some nice properties of, uh, of, uh, in, of complex numbers. So since the uh, magnitude of um, uh, the product of two complex numbers is the products of the magnitudes, and you can convince yourself of this if you are not already convinced by it, by just uh, expressing a complex number as a, um, as a, in its polar form, You'll see that if you do Z1 times Z2, what you get is M1 times M2, E at the J V E at the J V1, E at the J V2. So the magnitude of the product of two numbers is just the product of the two magnitudes. Well, this means that the magnitude of G of S is nothing but the uh, magnitudes of the numerator times the magnitudes of the different terms at the denominator. And if we look at each one of these terms, well, imagine that we are representing them in a, a, a plane where we have the real part of each term at the, at the, on the x-axis and the imaginary part here. Well, s plus two, or s minus p in general, represents the magnitude of this, represents the distance between uh, uh, some place P, so let's suppose we, we look at this term here, uh, S plus two, right? So P in this case is equal to uh, minus two. So suppose we take to the, on this minus two is a real number, so this is zero, we go minus one, and here is minus two, okay? Suppose we represent the minus two with the, a cross, and this is because we're gonna do this later on. Okay, so this is the position of the pole. Well, then suppose that I'm sending uh, an input that has a sine wave at some uh, frequency s. And suppose the frequency s is this one. It's a j, it's omega, right? Because we're sending a sine wave as an input. Well, the magnitude of one of one over s of g of s 
if we had only this component here, would be just this distance, which is the magnitude of S minus uh, S plus 2. So in general, if you just map the position of the poles and you ask yourself, well, how much is the magnitude of each term of this transfer function? All you need to do is just pick the S at which you want to find the response in, in this plane. Let's suppose we sent another sine wave at this point in frequency. Well, then this term would contribute with this distance to the magnitude. Well, suppose I sent a crazy signal that had S uh, could be rewritten at E at this, uh, let's call this S uh, zero. E at the S zero T, well, then that term would have contributed with this distance without having to do the calculations. So, well, let's take actually the, the, the real, um, this real example. Let me rewrite it here. What is it? G of S is equal to what? It's equal to twice S plus one over S plus two. S minus one minus J, S minus one plus J. Is this right? Plus one plus J, plus one minus J, plus one plus J. Okay, so how do we parse the response of this? We want to ask ourselves, what is the, um, we send an input that is uh, E at the J omega T. So this has a component that is, uh, uh, S is basically just the J omega, it's purely imaginary. This is the uh, imaginary axis. So, okay, what, uh, what, is the, what is the magnitude of the transfer function as a response to this, uh, to this input signal? So the first thing we do is we map all the different terms, the poles and the zeros. So we start from the, uh, from the zeros and we say, look, the zero is, S plus one, when is, what is the zero of this transfer function? It's the value of the S is such that the transfer function is equal to zero. That is the numerator of the transfer function is equal to zero. So the zero is minus one. It's a real number, so we go on the real axis. This is zero, this is minus one. We put a nice big ball circle where uh, we have zeros, okay? And then we ask ourselves, where are the poles of the transfer function? Well, the poles of the transfer functions are the zeros of the denominator of the transfer function. So we go and check, now we broke this down on purpose so that the factors show us the poles right away. The poles are, um, okay, sorry, there was a mistake on S plus two, otherwise it didn't make any sense. So this is minus two is the first one, right? So the pole here is what value of S makes this go to zero? Well, if S is equal to minus two, minus two plus two makes zero, right? So this is the first pole, then that's called the second pole comes from here. Well, if S plus one minus J has to be equal to zero, it means S is equal to J minus one. So what does it mean? It means we have uh, minus one on the real axis and plus one on the, uh, on the, this is one on the imaginary axis. So this is pole two. And pole three, of course, is the complex conjugate version of this, which just means the symmetric with respect to the x-axis. Okay, so what's the magnitude of G of S? The magnitude of G of S is the magnitude of these, is, the, is, the, is this um, product of the magnitudes of each term. So what is the input we're saying? We're, we're sending in. We're sending an input that is, suppose S equals uh, j, j of e at the j omega t, but we choose omega to be one so that we have this value here. So we pick s equal one and we ask, we, look, we check all, the, diff, all the, 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 the distances between the poles and the zeros. And at this point, it's, it's relatively straightforward to find them, right? Because these, this is basic geometry. So let's see, this is a one, this is a one. So if we consider this tri triangle here, uh, well, what's the, what's, what's the length of this? It must be a root of two, right? And in fact, here it is. Now let's look at the other one, uh, the contribution of the first uh, pole. So we had the pole at minus two. We, have, we are asking ourselves, what's, what's the contribution of this term if we send a sine wave with one as, as S on the imaginary axis? Well, you just consider this other triangle here. And uh, well, this is one, this is two. So what's the length of this? Well, it's root of five, right? Because it's two squared plus one squared. And, and you do the same thing for all the other two parts. No, so what would this be? Well, this part here is gonna be one, right? Because it's, it's just one. 
And uh, what about this part here? Well, this is one, this is two. So again, it's gonna be a root of five. So if you just plug in all these terms, you get exactly what's the uh, response of the transfer function, the magnitude of the transfer function at that specific point. And we didn't have to plug in numbers, we didn't have to do any real part, imaginary parts. It's a graphical way to calculate what the magnitude of the response is. Now, okay, we can do it with the magnitudes, but magnitudes only tell part of the story, right? Can we do it with the phases as well? Well, it turns out that, uh, yes, if you just uh, are a little bit careful about things. So, again, we know that the, um, what's the, what's the, um, are there any questions about this? What is the phase of a product of two complex numbers? Well, again, uh, remember that you can write a complex number as the magnitude E at the J phase. If you just do the product of two numbers, you get M1, M2, E at the J phi 1, E at the J phi 2, which means that you can just put them together like this. So the phase of the product of two numbers is equal to what? It's equal to the sum of the phases of each of the two individually, right? So, very well, what's the phase of the, of the G of S? Well, G of S was what? Was this coefficient in front of it times uh, um, S plus one over S plus two, S plus one plus J, S plus one minus J. So all we have to do to calculate the phase of G is check the phases of each one of these terms and keep into account the broader rule. So we're gonna sum up all the terms at the numerator and we're gonna subtract all the, term, the phases of all the terms at the denominator. So the question now really becomes what is the phase of each one of these terms, right? Because, okay, we can break down this. Uh, keep in mind that the general form of the transfer function is always a ratio of polynomials. So even the most complex possible cases, the transfer function, it's only gonna be a bunch of terms that multiply a terms like these at the numerator and a bunch of terms like these at the denominator. So through this approach, an arbitrarily complex transfer function can be broken down to its elementary terms and each one studied to find out magnitude and phase. Well, the question now becomes, what's the phase of one of these terms? Well, the phase of one of these terms, of a term S minus P, is the angle formed with the local axis. So in this case, well, we have the same situation as before. This was minus one, this was minus one minus two, this was one, and what we get is that, um, well, now, what's the angle of, uh, um, so here we, ha we have to keep in mind that uh, G of S had the, the two in front of it as well, right? So this, you can imagine it as, uh, uh, let's say, a two here, and the phase of two is equal to zero. It's, uh, it's um, sorry, no, it's equal to one. It's a positive number. No, my bad. The phase of two is equal to zero. It's the angle formed between this vector and the horizontal, right? Now let's look at the term, at, at all the other terms. So S plus one, well, the zero means that it's placed at S minus one. What's this angle here? Well, this angle here, again, we look at the geometry, uh, at the geometry of this triangle, it's uh, 45 degrees, right? Because it's, it's half of a square. And what about the other ones? Well, uh, this term here, well, the angle between uh, the local horizontal and this, uh, and the relative distance between uh, the point we're evaluating and the pole is a zero, and that's this term here. Now, what about these other ones? Well, these are not straightforward because uh, an angle is always the inverse tangent of delta y over delta x, basically, okay? So this is the delta y, in this case is what? is um, actually this is minus one, my bad. So it's uh, the tangent inverse of two. And what about this term here instead? This term here is the tangent inverse of this is a one, this is a two, so it's gonna be the tangent inverse of one half. And these are all angles, right? Now, whatever that is, you plug it in the calculator, you turn out what, what the angle is. So now you know that the phase of the transfer function at that specific point in frequency is given by the sum of the phases of the numerator. So the two you can imagine it, of course, being at the numerator. 
And uh, this uh, plus uh, the, the, or subtracting the terms, the phases of the terms of the denominator. And this is a very, um, let's say, practical way of evaluating uh, the response of a system at a specific point of frequency, just by using cal I mean, relatively simple calculations. It's all about figuring out what angles are and doing basic uh, um, geometric considerations on rectangular triangles, basically. So if we just uh, uh, put these results together for the example we saw before, we saw we, we evaluated that the phase is uh, at this point in frequency minus 45 degrees. We saw that the, um, the magnitude was roughly 0 0.6. So let's see if it's true. We plug everything into a computer and we say, okay, let's send in an input that is this uh, sine wave that has unit amplitude here, you see. And uh, what's the output? Well, the output is uh, something that is uh, the magnitude of g of j omega times the same sine wave. It was a frequency t minus uh, v, where this is the phase of the transfer function. And if you look now, the output, this curve here, has a magnitude that is uh, um, 0 0.56 times the magnitude of the input. The magnitude of the input was one. So here we have 0 0.565 and the phase is exactly 45 degrees uh, delayed. So this is a convenient way to uh, build up these signals. So now, are there any questions on this? No. So now we have figured out what is a way to actually calculate what the answers are, right? Now let's, let's, let's do a little bit more of, a, of an analysis and say, okay, but in general, what is the effect of poles and what is the effect of zeros? Now, in order to figure that out, we introduce uh, a few new concepts. And uh, there, are, there are some, like, uh, up to now, we, we, we use this uh, special magic input, E at the ST, to, to derive uh, some properties of the responsive systems. There are a couple other famous, let's say, notable inputs that are often used to, to evaluate, for example, performances or other properties of systems. The first one is the so-called uh, unit impulse. So, so the unit impulse is when the U of T is a delta of Dirac. How many of you know what a delta of Dirac is? Everybody, fantastic. So delta Dirac is not a real function, you know, uh, but it has some fancy properties. That is, if you just integrate it, you get a one. Uh, but if you evaluate it at any point apart from its origin, it's equal to zero. Uh, what we really want to keep in mind for the delta of Dirac is this nice property here. So if you integrate the product of any kind of function times the delta of Dirac at some point A, what you get is F evaluated at that point A. It's basically like a snapshot operator. If you imagine uh, your function being like this, and you're doing this operator with a delta of Dirac around a point A, all you're getting is the integral means the sum, right, of this times this. But uh, the um, delta is basically 0, 0, 0, 0, apart from 1 here, and 0, 0, 0 all over the place. So every time you multiply two of these things, you get 0, 0, 0. All you get as an output is uh, f of A. So it's like taking a slice of a function at a specific point in time, OK? Another nice input that is relevant is the so-called uh, the step input. So the step input is basically just a, 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 a unit input for all times uh, bigger or equal than zero, basically. And, uh, and it's nice because it allows us uh, to see how the dynamics, the transient response of the system evolves. And then there are other uh, inputs that are, that are used. Im imagine this to be like a polynomial of, of, of order zero, right? So then you can say, okay, but I could use a polynomial of order one, of order two, of order three, or whatever it is. So there is higher order inputs that uh, are sometimes used to, to characterize the response of the system. So let's look at the impulse response first. What is the impulse response? Well, the impulse response is the response when you send an impulse as an input, right? So what we're doing is we're saying, look, consider u of t to be delta of t. And now let's take a system, x dot equals ax plus bu, that has some simplified, uh, uh, let's say we consider x naught to be equal to zero. So we just look at the steady state response. And um, let's consider d equal to zero just because in 99.9% .9 of cases, 
is going to be equal to zero and the, and the systems you're going to be um, dealing with. And we plug in now U of T equals the delta of the rack. Now, what's going on here? Uh, it's going on that all we have to do, I don't know if you remember, the general expression of Y of T was a C E at the A T X naught plus the integral of what? Of C E at the A T minus tau B U of tau in D tau, right? So if we said x naught is equal to zero, this part goes away. And actually here we had a d u of t as well, right? We said d is equal to zero, so this part goes away. So we can focus only on the, on, on the complicated part, okay? Which is this convolution integral. So what happens when we choose u of t to be a delta of Dirac? Well, what we have to do is plug delta of tau here. And if you notice, this is an integral in tau, right? So it means that uh, what we're doing is we're leveraging this property of, um, this property of the delta of Dirac, which means that in this case, uh, we have to plug tau equal to zero. So what we get is this function here, evaluated at tau equal to zero, which is C E at the A T B. Now, notice, this is called the impulse response of a system. And it's the same as if, uh, look at the Y of T here, it's the same as if we chose as uh, initial conditions B. So here we had X naught and we will put a B here, we get the same response, okay? So why is this important? Well, because we spent a full class looking at uh, how could we understand that first term that depended on the initial conditions of the output. And we saw, look, here, like we introduced modal forms, we did this modal transformations, and we showed that that term could actually be broken down in a sum of elementary terms that changed the magnitude with the, an exponential form that was related to the AM values of the A matrix. And uh, so this gives us a little bit of insight because it tells us, look, the impulse response of a system, that is, if you take a system and you just hit it with an impulse, okay? It's like the physical representation of hitting it with an impulse is imagine you have a pendulum or a favorite panel and you're shooting a bullet, okay? The moment the bullet touches the pendulum, that's as if, as if you're sending an input, uh, an input uh, impulse to the, to, 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 to the pendulum. It's like something that is zero all the time, but one at some specific instant. That has the same structure, that response, as initial conditions with a particular choice of x naught. So it's basically going to be a sum of exponentials where, uh, uh, where the, where the um, eigenvalues of the A matrix are going to determine which contribution each term of this exponential gives. And, um, and okay, so let's keep that in the bag of our, of our tools because uh, it's going to turn out to be very important. It's going to turn out that this, uh, impulse response basically characterizes fully the response of the system. Once you know an impulse response of the system, it's as if you know the transfer function of the system. It's actually exactly the same thing. The transfer function is the Laplace transformation of the impulse response, but we'll, we will see that later on. So, okay, what about the unit step response? So remember, the unit step response is when you send a unit step to the, sig to the system. So it's a U of t equal to one for all t bigger or equal than zero, right? So, well, U of t equal to one can be imagined as, an, as a signal that is uh, one of our favorite that we know everything about now, we have the ST, but uh, with uh, S equal to zero. So, well, if we just plug in as before u of t equal one this time, we get this integral. This is relatively easy to solve if there exists, of course, the inverse of A, and uh, we get this expression. Now, what does this expression tell us? Well, um, First of all, we can uh, uh, see that, um, we can recall that uh, the steady state response is given by uh, C inverse B, right? Because uh, look at this term here, well, one of them depends on the E at the AT and the other one doesn't. Well, it's the same argument we did at the very beginning, E at the AT for a system that is asymptotically stable will eventually drive this whole term to zero. 
So the steady state response, so after enough time has passed that all the transient behaviors have died out, you get that the steady state response is this term here, okay? And uh, if, we, if we look at this expression, but uh, we consider a scalar system, that is a system uh, uh, where A is not a matrix, but it's just a number, then we can bring this out and we can represent the step response as the steady state response with this term here. This is a very common response you get in a bunch of first order systems in, in, uh, in uh, nature, which is basically saying, look, if this is the steady state response, uh, and you start from some initial conditions, uh, what you'll see in time is basically your steady state response uh, minus the at the AT. You know, it could be something like this, for example. And I don't know if you remember, we did an example of this at the beginning. We said, ah, we can find the time constant, which is related to the exponent. This, this, this is nice to keep in mind. So, so yes, the input response is going to be something that uh, we're going to use often to see the transient behavior of uh, outputs. We'll continue next time.